leader in the health the creation of progressive programs that optimize patient outcomes, improve the quality of care, and advance health equity. Most recently, oops, sorry, I realize I'm not. Most recently, um, Dr. O'Hara Scott served as Executive Vice President of Population Health at Summit Health and as Vice President of Clinical Strategy and Product at Anthem. She also brings MDH experience. She last served in the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene from 2011 to 2015 as Deputy Secretary of Public Health Services. Dr. O'Hara Scott is a veteran of the United States Army Reserves, serving from 1998 to 2008 as a major in the Medical Corps. She received a master's degree in public health from Johns Hopkins University and a doctor of medicine from SUNY Health Science Center in Brooklyn, New York. She currently lives in Towson, Maryland with her husband and two children. Welcome, Dr. Scott. I'll use my outside voice. Can you hear me okay? Or should I go even louder? Okay. Well, one, thank you for having me and thank you for letting me go first. Um, fortunately, I have other things I need to take care of related to work um, and mostly reading and responding to emails. So I really appreciate being able to go to the head of the line. Um, so I was really, really excited to participate tonight, especially when thinking about the topic, how do we build trust back into public health? It's been a really rough road the last few years during COVID. Uh, for a variety of different reasons. And we're really at a pivotal point to really rethink the public health system and the kinds of investments that we need to be making to shore up our infrastructure. So one of the things for sure, all of you in your respective roles are how do we um, engage our public health professionals to restore the trust in public health? And so I wanna touch on some few key items is certainly the work that we're doing in the department, but even as all of you in your respective roles, the opportunities you have. So first and foremost is building the public health workforce. I know COVID was super, super hard. I was on the private side doing different work at the time, working from home, and I was not in the trenches like all of you were during COVID. And not only were we questioning the science at the time, but, but we politicized some of what was happening during COVID, which made the trust in public health even harder. Um, on top of that, you were working very long hours, unappreciated, and in some cases, because of the politiz politicization of everything that was going on, some of us might have even been threatened in our respective roles. And so what we saw was people leaving public health and choosing not to be public health professionals for a variety of reasons, including burnout, dissatisfaction, not enough pay, and lack of recognition for just all the hard work you've done. So one of the things we're taking a look at is first and foremost is public health for sure in, our, in the way we think about it is local. And first and foremost, we need to be investing in our local health departments. And so we are prioritizing how we think about funding, including making sure that the people that are uh, providing those services locally are adequately um, um, reimbursed for their services or compensated for their services through their pay. I didn't tell him to do that, but. Um, the other thing we're looking at is two and four year programs and how do we think about, so College Park has a bachelor's level public health program and even thinking about interest in the kinds of programs at two year schools to engage um, students to think about public health as a career. Many people don't know what it is and what does that mean to be a public health practitioner. So working with the two-year schools and the four-year schools to engage interest in public health. And even if there's not a public health degree, thinking about other degrees that we use in all our respective roles, whether that's social work, whether that's nursing, whether that's um, disease intervention specialist, but, but how do we bring in the workforce um, to meet the, the future of what needs to happen. One of the things that we're doing now in the department as we engage college campuses, we're also looking at our job descriptions. You know, some of our job descriptions are pretty dated and the requirements for what we're asking people of to do the respective roles are outdated. And so we're looking at 
um, many of our job descriptions to think about, could we do on the job training and get people engaged in public health that way and then create some kind of stipend if they wanna go to school for some advanced degree. But we're looking at all our options, thinking about the workforce. Certainly working with clinicians that are interested in programmatic development and health policy. So I often get asked by first and second year interns or nurse practitioning students or physician's assistants, how can I get involved in public health? And we think that's a perfect opportunity to start introducing them into what is public health? Do you want to build clinical programs? Do you want to work on health policy? Do you want to work on community engagement strategies or even just communication? Um, and so really working to think about the workforce. And then lastly, working with the schools of public health and researchers to translate the science into programs. So we know that there's a lot of research going on, and even if it's not formalized research, but, but anecdotal or pilot programs going on, how can we document what's happening in the literature and then take that information and build clinical programs. And then if we find that those clinical programs work, how do we share that information so we can start taking these programs to scale? Many of you might have developed programs. You get some seed funding. The, pro the funding goes away and the program goes away. So we're trying certainly to think about sustainability, especially for programs that we know uh, work. Now, Talked about workforce, want to spend a little time talking about investing in community-based solutions that advance public health. So we learned um, during COVID that we can't do it alone. And our partnerships with our community-based organizations and faith-based organizations were vital to getting people vaccinated, as an example. And we don't necessarily have the trust um, in the community, um, especially post-COVID, but how can we work with our community-based organizations and our faith-based organizations that are trusted partners to help us get the messaging out? And how do we think about that messaging differently? There's often a one-size-fits-all message, but maybe we need to think about the populations we're trying to serve. So how do we think about adolescents and what are the opportunities around adolescents and even adolescent influencers on social media and how can we leverage them to help us get the message out? And how do we think about our millennials now, different population, but how do they want to get uh, their messages? Or even older individuals like myself now, you know, the, the example I give is if I text my dad, my dad says, why didn't you pick up the phone and call me? But if I text, if I call my son, my son is like, why can't you just text me? What do you need? So given those generational gaps, we have to start thinking about the messaging of what we're trying to have accomplished in public health. We want to think about stable funding tied to outcomes. So we fund a lot of different initiatives, but we don't always know whether they work. So how can we start thinking about how to measure those things that we work? And I don't mean bean counting. Uh, we had you know, 10 meetings, we did five trainings, we served 30 people. But if we serve 30 people, did they do what we asked them to do? Or if we did five trainings, could we check in in three months and six months and ensure the durability of that training? Did they retain what we asked them, what we trained them on, and how is that information being used? We certainly want to drive health outcomes and health equity. So I think you know, certainly under Governor Moore's leadership and even with some of the, the funding that's been coming out of the federal government through CDC, through HRSA, there is more and more a focus on health equity. All of you have known about the disparities that exist in not only access to care, but health outcomes related to care. And we're finally starting to get better, better data than we've ever had before to start breaking down that data by race and ethnicity and understanding what the barriers are to accessing care. We know black women, for instance, have horrible outcomes related to pregnancy. And if you listen to those women, it's not just about the chronic diseases, although they're entering pregnancy with more and more chronic diseases, but it's how they're treated and the experience in their delivery of care. So how do we address that? Right now, we're doing um, working with doulas for many women, but we've we're, we're, that's a patch to the delivery system to me. So how do we fix the delivery system to make people more sensitive about 
um, who we're serving and why we're serving them. So there's a lot of work to be done to improve cultural sensitivity. I can tell you as a Latino woman, when I practice, I always knew my patients were in the waiting room because I could hear the medical assistants talking really loud. And so I would go out there because I knew my patients, my monolingual Spanish patients were out there. And I was like, they're not deaf. They just don't understand English. But they thought by talking louder, somehow they would understand what was going on. And so I often translated in the front, translated at when I was seeing patients, and then translated at discharge. And you can imagine how late I ran after that, but thinking about culturally appropriate and language appropriate. You know, the department, um, we're going through Medicaid redeterminations, and we did not do a great job in translating some of our Medicaid redetermination. The department that I lead did not do a good job in translating our redetermination um, materials in Spanish. And so we heard from the Latino caucus that we were missing the mark and we really needed to do a better job translating our, our materials. So we pulled them out and then we started to um, work with a, a, a better translator than what we had to make sure that we were at, you know appropriately capturing the information. But these kind of things really matter when we're trying to deal with culturally appropriate um, um, populations and then to drive the outcomes in those populations. So I already talked about certainly African-American and pregnancy, um, Latinos and, and behavioral health. Um, I've heard um, from many uh, community, especially for monolingual Spanish, that behavioral health providers don't want to take them because using the translation services takes too long. So access to care has been really problematic. Certainly for the LGBTQ plus um, provide, um, community, we don't have enough providers that understand not only um, their wants and needs related to how they receive their care, but even what's culturally appropriate. So we have to think about that workforce as well. We need to start defining data sets, especially new ones, so that data is captured on the front end. So we're starting with race and ethnicity, but we know there are other populations that we need to be thinking about if we're going to be thinking about how to better deliver population health and how to build trust in the health that we are delivering that way. And then, of course, setting targets. What do we want to do as, as public health practitioners? We want to reduce you know, infant mortality by X. We want to reduce complications in African-American women by Y. But we are starting to hold ourselves accountable to measures in a way that the public health system maybe hasn't been accountable for. Um, data modernization. We have a long way to go with our data. I don't know how many of you work with, uh, maybe for those of you that work in academic settings, you have access to better data sets, but public health data is dirty. And it's often takes a lot of cleaning to make it useful. And it's often not at the patient level. It's de-identified, it's aggregated. And so we can talk about communities and we can talk about populations and we can talk about census tract, but just because you live in a census tract or community, it may not mean that that thing we're looking at impacts you. And then how do you tease out that information or bring other data sets to the table to start thinking about how you um, drive um, your intervention? And I'll give you a perfect example of that. So um, lead, many of you, are familiar with lead and, and um, the state has typically used a peanut butter approach to how we fund lead-based programs. But in certain communities that are especially newer communities, they don't really have lead. And even though you should screen, I want to be more intentional with where we're screening for lead. So how do we screen for lead in communities that we know are older that were built prior to the 70s? Peanut oh, peanut butter approaches, we spread the funding evenly, try to meet everyone's needs. So we don't target it based on where the morbidity is. So I should have clarified what peanut butter approach is. Who knows peanut butter approach? Okay, well, there you go. So we spread the funding trying to make every all jurisdictions happy, but not all jurisdictions have... Um, 
um, lead is an issue. And so as we think about, you know, the impact of lead and cognitive declines and um, certainly in uh, communities of color and what that does for behavioral health, what that does for intellectual disabilities, what that does for um, success in school, moving forward, we're going to be more intentional about how we fund and where we fund. But we think by doing that, we will better build trust in the communities that we're trying to move the needle. So not sprinkling dollars everywhere, but really being intentional around where we put dollars um, so that those communities can thrive. Um, and so as we think about that data, how do we figure out where do we fund and how do we prioritize what we fund? So we talked a little about modernizing our data system, certainly building interoperable data systems. Um, we have lots of data everywhere. So we have our statewide health information exchange. I don't know how many of you are familiar with what's called CRISP, which is the Chesapeake Regional Information System for our patients. And it's a health information exchange that pulls hospital data forward. So if you touch the delivery system, it allows hospitals to see information information across the systems. It also allows, if you have a care manager either at the hospital or at your doctor's office or maybe with your insurance company, for them to help you manage your care. Now, what if we could take that, that information that's in the health information exchange and start marrying it with our public health data? We're starting to do that now to paint a better picture of where the morbidity is and where we should be focusing our efforts. And certainly, how do we make this data more timely so it can be um, um, used more real time to drive decisions? Our data is also often old. We publish data that's a year or two old, which is really not actionable. But if we could marry it with the data from the hospital systems and other real time data systems, we can we can address issues more real time and not a year or two after we saw the data. And certainly disaggregating the data in a way that allows us to be more specific and to learn more about the communities we serve, such as at the census tract or even at the block level. Um, for some of you who may be familiar with um, some of the work that was done in Harlem years ago, that started as a block level just to improve the health and resources of a block in Harlem that then grew over time and became a renaissance for Harlem. But what if we could do that at the community level, block by block, really understanding the needs and then taking action that way. By doing this in smaller communities and chunking out the work, it allows us to build trust. And as you build trust, then they communicate that with others to say how health departments, local or state, are supporting their needs. And then, of course, thinking about focus areas. So I talked a little bit about race and ethnicity and populations based on those categories, but what about the big things in public health? So thinking about women's health overall. Today, we announced with Governor Moore a partnership we have with Upstream to, to provide um, contraceptive on demand. So not just having you go to a women's health clinic or an OBGYN, but your primary care to do um, or get contraception on demand? How do we think about interpersonal violence to protect women's health? How do we think about uh, women specific um, um, uh, health conditions such as menopause? Or how do we think about gender neutral um, conditions that affect women in different ways such as how women might present with a heart attack? Or even thinking about in my past life that I worked at the VA and um, uh, there was a certain drug that wasn't being used that was common for treating um, cholesterol because it was a category B drug. And so women of child bearing age weren't getting a medication because it was a category D drug, which means it uh, could be harmful if you got pregnant to the baby. So how do we think about um, women's health as a continuum of care? Certainly violence prevention. So violence has been traditionally uh, a focus of on the policing side, um, but what about violence as a public health framework and what are the levers that we can push and pull? So as I think about certainly behavioral health and how do we address some of the behavioral health issues that maybe drive violence, or if we think about trauma, or if we think about other conditions that drive that, you know, keeping kids in school, 
um, um, supporting families when they need the support. And then, of course, thinking about opioids. How do we think about um, addressing opioids, um, especially now with um, fentanyl and uh, xylazine into our drug supply? And how do we get the resources we need locally? So we're certainly thinking about data in a lot of different ways, by condition, by people, by census tract. But as we think about those ways, we're also thinking about the data that we need to share with them the, the programs that we're building that builds trust in the communities, that public health is a trusted workforce um, and is here to support um, their needs. And then lastly, how do we meet the needs of the community? So oftentimes we think what the community needs and wants, and then we build those things without actually engaging the community and asking them, what is it that you need from public health? What is it that you need? Um, you know, years ago with all the Flint, Michigan, with the water supply, it was a very astute pediatrician that identified that there were a cluster of kids that were coming in with these increased leads. But then program started building based on that. But the community had been complaining about their water way before it was identified. And had they asked the community, they might have been able to intervene sooner to, to, to address more of what was going on. But all these things between the workforce, between um, the data, between translating the science into practice are all ways to build trust in the community and then communicating those efforts large and wide to make sure um, that they're recognized. And then last but not least, I wanna leave you with this. Public health that is its best prevents disease, which makes it hard for people to appreciate that they have benefited. So oftentimes you're in the background doing the things that is keeping the community safe without appreciation until that thing is no longer available. And the most recent and most you know, troubling thing that I see today is the idea that we have babies being born with congenital syphilis and we have more STIs than we've had in a very long time and infant mortality rates are going up. And this is mostly as a result of funding that was pulled back from public health to do the job that it needs. So reinvesting in public health is certainly the way we're gonna build the workforce, the way we're gonna build the trust, um, and again, rebuild uh, the system of care that makes it hard for people to appreciate that public, is in, public health is in the background, keeping them safe from disease and other uh, um, conditions, environmental or otherwise. So with that, I thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Scott? Okay. All right. Great. Well, thank, thank you. you so much. It's a little, little something to remember us by. Thank you. But thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule. All right. Okay, so back to the regular scheduled programming. Um, so as always, wanna thank the sponsors that are in the room. Uh, Morgan State University, the School of Community Health and Policy, um, School of Public Health, the, the FAB program, with uh, it's FAB Lab, which is actually here, and I'm gonna have Dr. Melton come up in a uh, few seconds to come explain what these little contraptions are around the room. Um, then Suburban Hospital, uh, Maryland Healthcare for All, and the Maryland Rural Health Association. So thank you all. Without your help and your sponsorship, we could not have done this program um, without you all. Um, and so a few reminders. We actually do have some free items available um, in the front when you first registered. We also have some items for sale over on the left-hand side. Kate, if you wouldn't mind waving your hand. Um, so we do have two items. We have a uh, water bottle, an MDPHA water bottle, brand new swag um, that we have there. And we also have a travel mug. So all donations, they're all donations and we are a 501c3, so it's tax, seeking, tax deductible. We appreciate anything you can provide to us. Um, yeah. Dr. Milton, if you wanna come up and explain what's going on. Hi, thank you for this opportunity to uh, speak to the group a little bit. 
about the UV light fixtures that we put up around the room. Unfortunately, uh, this room is a little difficult to rig because it doesn't have very many outlets accessible. But uh, these devices we had at the uh, meeting at Tacoma Park. We, we had these devices last year at the uh, Tacoma Park venue, some of you will remember. Um, in a somewhat smaller place with more outlets, we were able to get a few more into the space. Uh, we are, uh, the, the Public Health Aerobiology Lab is focused on understanding how pandemic and epidemic respiratory viruses are transmitted and technologies that we can uh, use to try to prevent transmission. Um, and uh, we have a table back uh, opposite the registration with some more information about our work. And I hope you'll come by and talk with us. Uh, we are actively recruiting people to join our lab and especially working with us uh, on an NIH funded study to de really nail the case for what is the role of aerosol inhalation versus touch and spray in transmission of influenza. We are renting the entire 14th floor of the Lord Baltimore Hotel and bringing in uh, people to uh, study the transmission during the winter season, which we expect to start any minute. Um, so uh, please come talk to us. Uh, if you know people who are interested in graduate study in doctoral students and master's students in understanding indoor air and germicidal UV, uh, we'd really be interested to, to talk to you. And we are also organizing focus groups and working on communications and understanding the technology because as we all learned during the pandemic, communications and, and, and understanding how people understand messages about clean air, about public health, about masks, about vaccines. These are critical. We can have the technologies if nobody uses them, if nobody takes the shots, it's not going to work. And so we're working on that too. And we uh, encourage you to come by and learn more about what we're doing. Um, I also want to shout out to our, my friend, uh, Dr. Wilbur Chen, uh, who is running the show up in the Lord Baltimore Hotel uh, for these influenza transmission studies, because uh, I know some of you uh, are up in Baltimore know him. Thank you. All right, this program that we're at today would not be possible without these lovely people. So Jonas, I wanna thank you for all your work that you've done. As president-elect, Jonas is in charge of our entire programming committee. So this was all his ideas, what he wanted to do, his theme, his everything that he was doing. So thank you, Jonas, for your leadership. Um, the other folks on the screen, so Alona Yale, who made the program, the beautiful program. Um, if uh, we actually, um, I want to mention that there is some parts that are missing. I don't know what happened in printing. Probably shouldn't have mentioned that, but there are some parts of the program that are missing. And if you, we have QR codes if you want to download them because it actually will have the election information in there as well. So, um, so you know who you're going to be voting for. Um, as well as some other uh, upcoming events, but I'll be talking about those as well. Um, so, Yale, thank you so much. He, he's not here, but I know he's probably watching. He's on the virtual. So we are a hybrid meeting this year. Um, we have all of you lovely folks here, and we also have some um, folks online. So thank you all so much for joining. Jody Gann, our past president, who will be very sad to see go. Um, Michelle Glover-Brown, who is our ARGCR affiliate representative to the Governing Council. Kate McGrail, our lovely treasurer. Myself, um, Gladys and Dalma, who is one of our interns from Towson University, and I'll talk more about the interns shortly. Um, Tosin Alatejou, who is um, she is actually is a our advocacy co committee co chair. She's not on our board, but she offers a lot of her time to our um, to MDPHA, um, Antoinette and Brianna. Thank you both so much. Um, and Jonas, I'm going to have you come on up sta uh, on stage and just kind of talk a little bit about, you know, our agenda for the day, for the night.
Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Hope you're having a good time. We promise a really awesome event. Uh, this is ex excellent. So our program for this evening, you have a copy on you. Uh, this and we'll pick up, or at least we'll continue with the business meeting and get all that business stuff out of the way, uh, where we uh, just report on what we've been doing, the activities and accomplishments of the past year. And then you get to meet our board nominees and all that, and we do all that stuff. Then we'll also be hearing from our uh, climate and health initiative updates. We do have one of our priorities in Maryland as a health advo advocacy and climate advocacy. We'll do that. Then we have our awesome, awesome guest speakers. Okay. Ms. Ella Green Morton, who is the president of American Public Health Association. And then my very own from my own county health, health department, Dr. Gregory Branch, who is the director of the Baltimore uh, County Health and Human Services. Following that, we go into our awards. We have some awards to present to deserving individuals and programs that have made an impact in public health within the state of Maryland. And to wrap it up, we'll have some fun. It's not going to be all business. We have some health jeopardy. As we know, the program jeopardy, this time we're doing the same thing, but public health jeopardy. And you can win some awesome swag and giveaways. So stay tuned. Thank you. All right, on to our business meeting. I don't want to call it a business meeting. It's more of just the highlights that we've had for this fantastic year. Um, we will talk a little bit about finance. We're going to beat, uh, beat, meet the board nominees, and then we're going to um, do our elections and approval of the legislative priorities. So if you are an MDPHA member, you all should have gotten a ballot when you first came into the door. If you did not, um, when it gets to that time, I'll have you raise your hand and please vote because as a member, that is one of your... Um, not, I won't say duties, but it's one of your, um, thank you. Well, words are not coming to me today at all. I'm a, I'm a data person. I work with data all day, every day. And so talking to people is fun. <laughs> um, so we're going to, yeah, it's one of the privileges of being a member in addition to coming to the, these meetings as well as networking. And then we're going to do a little thank you for all of our retiring or our graduating board members. Um, can I have everyone that's on the board stand up and wave your hands? I want to, uh, so you met myself and Jonas, um, Ali Diorio, our secretary. Thank you so much. We have Kate McGrail, our treasurer, um, Michelle Glover Brown, who's over at registration, who you met over there, and then Jody, if you wouldn't mind waving, our past president. Yale is not here, as I said before, but he is online. Um, Lily and I, uh, Ed Begbe, right there. Thank you, um, Ilona Argurian. I saw you. There you are. Um, Crystal Phillips. Oh, um, Melissa Buckley. Cassandra, uh, she's ill. Uh, Kara, I don't believe is here either. Jonathan Dayton. Thank you. Nia Lindsay. And Garrett Martin, uh, Martin Yaboa. And then Antoinette Paris, who's over at registration. So thank you all. So we are a completely volunteer board. We're all here because we enjoy the work that we do. And if I hadn't, I probably didn't mention it before, but MDPHA, we are an affiliate of the American Public Health Association. So anywhere you move to, if you move to Colorado, there's a Colorado Public Health Association. If you want to learn more about affiliates, we have um, one of the staff members from APHA, Lindsay, of right over here, that can tell you a bit more about it. But we are a local, um, I call it chapter of APHA, but we're not because, well, we are and we aren't. We are an affiliation with them, but we have our own priorities. We are governed by our own selves. Each affiliate is different from the next. Um, but as I said before, we are all completely volunteer. We do have one staff member who I'm going to introduce, but she has one very specific role on our board and then we have our lovely interns that help us out um, um, to learn a lot more about what public health really is. All right, so we have two board members who have done amazing things this year outside, like in their professional world. Um, so Chosen Olateju, she actually is the new, um, she was appointed by Governor Wes Moore to serve as the Maryland Public Health Commissioner and she's the co-chair for that commission and, uh, and the commission 
will be assessing the foundational public health capabilities of the Maryland Department of Health and local health departments and makes recommendations to improve the delivery of foundational public health services in the state. So congratulations, Tosin, that's fantastic. And as I said before, so Tosin is one of our lovely co-chairs for our advocacy committee. So they are, her and Alona are very busy for about four months of the year in addition to the other eight months of the year. But those four months, so if you're very interested in advocacy, they could definitely use your help and expertise. Um, we do have a lot, uh, if you wanna go and do in-person testimonies, we have those capabilities. If you wanna help with writing those testimonies or just being a part of this lovely group and just helping out and learning more about policy and what's important in the state of Maryland, please talk to either Alona or Tosin or reach out to anybody on the board and we can connect you to them. Um, and then we have uh, Lillian Egbe. Uh, um, she received the governor's, Governor of Maryland Citation for Outstanding Community Service for her work in domestic violence. So thank you so much for your work there. It's um, she actually sent us an email saying, is it okay if I say that uh, to send a congratulations to myself? I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, I got this award. And we're like, of course you can do that. Like, congratulations. Thank you all for all your work. So congratulations, Lillian. It's fantastic. Thank you for all the work that you do. <laughs> Um, so every year since 2019, the Debo Mountain Foundation, who, which is located here in Maryland, um, they do a 40 under 40 in public health. This year we have, luckily in Maryland, we have two of those honorees, Rebecca Rear and Shelly Chu. Rebecca is at a conference, but Shelly, I believe, is here. I think I saw you, if you wouldn't mind standing up and saying hello. Um, so Shelly is the director of maternal and the uh, director of the maternal and child health bureau for the Maryland Department of Health. So thank you so much for all that you do, and congratulations again on this wonderful honor. All right, as much as before. So we do have um, one staff member, Melanie Bolden. I'm probably a little later. Um, so Melanie is our climate and health coordinator. Last year, um, we received a. Um, lovely grant from the Energy Foundation to do work in create a health table around climate and health. And so um, we had a one staff member last year that she graduated and went on to work at the University of Virginia, my alma mater. Um, but we are very lucky now to have Melanie, who is a P uh, DRPH student at Johns Hopkins. Melanie has hit the ground running since August, has done so much work, and you'll be hearing more from her about all the work that is involved with the health table and all the work that we're doing in climate and health. So welcome, Melanie. Oh. And for any of you that are having issues with registering or becoming a member, that was all Melanie that was responding to your emails. She wasn't causing the problems, she was helping resolve the issues. All right, so we do a lot, but I'm gonna start off with membership because I'm quite proud of these numbers. We have received uh, had an additional 217 new members, which is amazing for our small little state. Like, wow. Um, so we have many different member categories, our student chapters, which I will talk about shortly, are, are like, there are, fastest growing membership group that we have. I was a student last year, so I'm very much about students. Um, we do also have our organizational members. Um, you see all of them listed here. And the, um, a lot of them are universities because that's part of our student chapter format or structure that we have there. But I want to uh, thank the membership committee, Cassandra Chess and Melissa Buckley for all their work of reaching out to the last members, as well as creating a membership survey. So if, you, um, if you're a new member, you wouldn't have seen it yet, but if you have been a member of MDPHA, you would see a little link in our lovely bi-weekly emails that get sent out about a membership survey. Please fill it out. We're in public health, we need data. Please give us that data. Uh, so please fill it out. And we have all this swag. So I want to thank the interns, Gladys and Brianna, for helping us design the, um, the lovely swag that we have. All right, as I was mentioning with funding, so we got, um, last year it was $40,000 from the Energy Foundation, which is a lot more than we're ever used to. We have a, we're a smaller affiliate, but we do what we can with all the members that we 
that we have. Um, and then we got um, a few scholarships from APHA from, um, from the climate and health side. And so that actually helped support our work with the Energy Foundation to help do more capacity building, getting a, um, a nicer website, getting more swag, doing more of these networking opportunities that we want because we all were stuck inside the house for maybe two or three years. It's nice to get out and you know meet people. So I want to thank both the Energy Foundation and APHA for that. Um, Yale, who is our student representative, had this fantastic idea as one of the co-chairs of the Finance Committee to do a fundraising campaign with Kendra Scott. So that was actually a really fun and a unique event where we actually um, received a portion of the purchases for that day. So I'm you know, also have a look out for more of those opportunities to um, for fundraising, but we're always looking for unique and more um, non-traditional public health partners to do more fundraising as well as networking opportunities and learning opportunities with as well. Speaking of collaborating, um, we've done a lot of that this year. Um, we started off the year with our uh, Mid-Atlantic Partnership Regional Conference. So several years ago, the presidents and the executive directors of the uh, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and Maryland all got together at APHA and decided, hey, we're all in the same region. Let's do a conference together. So this was the third one, and we had... Um, it was a virtual conference. It was focused mostly on um, public health and climate change, response policy and implementation. We are gonna have another one this year and I'll talk about that shortly, but we'll preview Maryland is hosting it. Um, it's gonna be in the work of the future of public health, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So if you're interested or have any expertise, come talk to me, but that's gonna be in the spring. Um, we still are, we have a um, collaboration with the LEAD Collaborative and one of our uh, board members, Cassandra Chess, is our liaison for that. So we're very thankful for the opportunity to work with that organization. We did do some collaborations with um, the middle one, the webinar was one of our activities during National Public Health Week where we, we partnered with the Maryland Rural Health Association to do a webinar about addressing healthcare issues on the rural Eastern shore. Um, and then our climate change group, our health table, we had a collaboration with um, a couple organizations there to do a webinar in September. And then one of our interns who was not here, but she was, she created her, her own webinar about prioritizing children's health and the environment in the new school year. And we actually, as uh, she collaborated and created her own webinar, reached out to the speaker on her own um, with the Children's en um, Environmental Health Network. And we had a Narcan training that we collaborated with um, the Montgomery County Health Services. So communications, this was a big year for communications. And I know this is not a little plug for a picture of me. It's just because I'm the most recent public health professional in you. That's the only reason why. Um, but um, our lovely uh, communications co-chair Lillian, um, she is, like a, our own little journalist that we have. Um, so if we're right now, we're always looking for monthly um, public health professionals that wanna talk about the work that you do in the community. We don't know what you do if you don't tell us. And so she does a great job of really giving you like quick little interview questions, but she is very quick on her feet. And um, so that's one of our things that we have. It's on our website. Um, you can also, also find all of the past uh, your public health professional and you on our newly revamped YouTube page, which is down here on the right. Um, we revamped our website last year. And so we're still very proud of that. Um, lots of information on there. So if any information that I've forgotten, it can all be found on the website. Um, and we have our lovely bi-weekly emails that um, our communications committee and actually for the past several months, uh, one of our interns, Brianna has and Gladys have been working on. So all of that information that's in that bi-weekly email, it's a lot of information, but read through it. You can talk about what's going on in MDPHA, what's going on in Maryland, our student chapters, ways to get involved, jobs, I already said jobs, funding opportunities, what our student chapters are up to. Um, there's a lot of information there. So speaking of communications, Social media, and that's kind of similar to what Dr. Scott was talking about, was how do we engage the millennials? And our love, I hate, I don't like calling you all millennials, but you are. Um, our interns, and um, it's all uh, earlier, sorry, earlier this year with our intern, Hannah, she actually, um, this is just a hodgepodge of random 
social media posts that I found. But if you follow us on um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn, you will see a plethora of information. Every month there's something, every week there's something new. And that's all thank you to our lovely interns as well as our communications committee that has been really pushing that out. So we're trying to find new ways of informing the public that's not necessarily a member of MDPHA, but you know, if I post something, then I repost it and, you know, my friends will see it and someone else will see it. And that's really how it works. Like right? it's a snowball method. So please follow us on any one of these social media platforms. We're constantly on there. And if you have ideas or if you have any um, um, activities that are going on in your organization or if you have any jobs in your organization that you want to mention to us, please email us. Um, it was from uh, the get info at ndpha.org. So that's our social media. So what else do we do? So we do a lot of meeting. Oh, it should be 2023. I apologize. Um, so we had a summer social that occurred in August. Uh, it actually was a, a surprisingly good turnout considering there was a huge rainstorm and thunderstorm that happened that day. So I want to, like, there's a couple of folks that I see in here that were at that event. So thank you all for bearing with that. Um, but these are just other opportunities that we have throughout the year in addition to our annual event and other webinars that we have to do more networking and input person networking. Um, this is a picture of our board retreat that we had in June um, in Columbia, Maryland. And um, it's uh, one time a year, our board all gets together to plan out the rest of the year. What do we want to see done? What things do we still have to get done? Um, and kind of like check up on our roles and everything. How many of you were at the Atlanta APHA meeting? I see a couple of you. Awesome. How many of you got my impromptu email on Saturday afternoon saying, if you're here, please come hang out with us? <laughs> yeah. So it actually turned out really well. And I see Armin in the front. And I reckon, yeah, thank you so much for coming out and finding us. But with the success of that, we're planning on having more opportunities or having an opportunity at APHA um, to have more Maryland members just come together and do a little networking there too. So. So programming, um, Jonas, as the uh, president-elect, is in charge of the programming committee. And he, um, so we have National Public Health Week, which is always the first full week of April. And we have a full week of events. Um, the theme this year was Centering and Celebrating Cultures and Health. That is a top, um, the theme comes from APHA, and we're very thankful for all that they do and supporting our activities as well as sharing their activities with us as well. Um, some of the highlights were that we actually have a, um, we did a screening of the uh, short film Toxic, A Black Woman's Story, and we had a nice little discussion, um, a um, nice little discussion group for that. Um, we, every year we get, um, we're thankful for our funding that we're able to provide food to um, the local hospital. And so we did that, we provided them, I know it's not healthy, but Chick-fil-A, they wanted Chick-fil-A, so we gave them Chick-fil-A um, to the hospital actually in, uh, it's the North Capital region um, in uh, Landover. Um, and then tonight's annual event is another programming thing that we do. This is our biggest event of the year and a lot of planning goes into this and we're, you know, thankful so much for all of you to be here i mean the fact that the room is full i was worried that like we weren't going to have people come like i was very worried but thank you all so much we're very 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 much appreciative of all of you all right i like talking about our students because that's my heart um so right now we have four student chapters there also are an unaffiliated chapters so we have chapters at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy, which is actually where our first student chapter was started. And then we have um, Towson University, and then our newest is at Coppin State. So we have four right now. We still have some unaffiliated members, but we have a very robust student committee um, that is chaired by Yale. Um, he's always looking for students to get involved, to find ways to really figure out what do students want? What can we provide to students? I mean, Dr. Scott was just talking about that, right? Like, how do we engage? And how do we educate the next generation of public health professionals? And the students is really where it starts. Um, as like I said before, students is really my heart because I was just a student last year, no longer a student, thank goodness. But um, those student loans are starting to get paid off, but not excited about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, our student sections are, you know, this is actually our, we have a picture right here is actually, we had a student mixer at Towson University. That was, thank you, uh, Dr. Fry so much for organizing that. It was actually supposed to occur during National Public Health Week. And then there was a, 
um, lovely thunderstorm that canceled it. So we had to push it off. So thank you, Dr. Um, Fry, for re, um, reorganizing that. And so it was actually really nice to meet all of the students at Towson. It's actually all undergraduate students. So it's so exciting to meet undergraduates that are in public health. I myself, I'm gonna sound a little ignorant here, but I didn't know what public health was until I was looking for a master's degree. Did not know about it. And so seeing these undergraduates are like, I wanna do this, this, and this. And I'm like, that's fantastic. I wish I knew what I was gonna do in five years myself right now. Um, but seeing the like the energy and seeing just how much they want to learn and really just talk to you and pick your brain, you know, it's really making me think about we need to have a mentoring program. So any of you students out there want to help with starting a mentoring program in MDPHA, I'm sure we have plenty of mentors in the room here that can provide you with, you know, either career advice or just someone to talk to about what we can do in the world of public health. Um, and our student chapter, each, each student chapter has their own, um, their own independent organizations at their universities. So they run all the programs by themselves, whatever they want to do, they do it. They just tell us. And so it's just awesome. Just seeing the list of things that are happening at our student chapters and the amount of work that students are doing. Like when Dr. Like when we were at the mixer, uh, we were just seeing what all the students at Towson were doing. I'm like, you guys did so much. Like what? Like, I mean, it's, it was actually really impressive for what, you know, students students can do and like when they're really engaged and really passionate about something that you know and that's also for any one of us too you know not just as students but as for public health professionals if we really like something we're going to follow our path and follow our heart to do what we want to do so i'm very very happy about how our student chapters and our student membership is growing but we need to find ways to keep them engaged um, but also you know provide them with some mentoring and then speaking of mentoring um we have three interns. So Hannah is actually currently uh, studying abroad, but she was our um, fall and summer, in, I mean, our spring, no, our summer intern. And she actually started really that social media, just pushing our social media out there. She is a student at American University, as is um, Brianna Freeman. Brianna, would you mind standing up? Thank you, Brianna. Brianna is also a student at American University. She is a junior. I want to believe in um, public health. So thank you. So undergraduates. And then we also have Gladys Mdalama, who is at Towson University. Gladys, please stand up. And then um, this year, we also had an opportunity to uh, work with a practicum student at the University of Maryland. So Evan Gombert, um, he actually is a master's student working on his practicum, and he has an interest in environmental and climate health. And so he's actually helping us. If you saw, the, there was a survey that went out for public health practitioners, or, um, sorry, um, physicians, sorry, more of clinicians, public health clinicians, and uh, about their um, views and thoughts about around climate health and climate change. And that survey was all created by Evan. So if you know anyone that's, that's a, a public health clinician or just clinician, please pass on that survey. We're trying to get information so that we can actually use that information when we go into our um, legislative session in um, January. So we're gonna pull some data. And then he also, you know, it was fun working with Evan too, cause I was, he was doing some data work and I'm a data nerd. So loved working with that, that on that. So it was awesome just working with all these individuals and being really on the other side of the table of being the mentor, not the mentee. Um, so it was nice. So thank you all so much for providing me that opportunity of learning more about myself and being able to teach you all something. So thank you. So I did not edit these slides very well. Um, so last but definitely not least is advocating. We do a lot of advocacy. Um, so this year it was um, the advocacy committee chaired by Alona and Tosin um, waited on 24 bills of which eight were passed. Um, you can actually find all this information on our website. So the four main topics that were covered were public health infrastructure, substances regulation. So that's um, smoking alcohol or cigarettes, alcohol, and uh, tobacco, alcohol, and cannabis. Um, environmental health, which our um, health table really helped a lot with. And then children and young adult health. Um, so thank you so much for doing that work. And I know they're going to they're gonna stay on as co-chairs for the committee. So they have a lot of plans for this upcoming year, as well as a advocacy training event next Wednesday. Um, so we're very excited about that. So I'm actually going to um, take a break for a second and call up our treasurer to talk about our finance committee updates. Okay, let's get our okay.
Hello. How's everybody? You can hear me okay. Great. Good evening. I'm Kate McGrail. I am the board treasurer. Um, I That means I am on the finance committee. And I am the chair of the finance committee. And my the other member of the finance committee, you've heard his name a lot because he's wonderful, Yale Friedman. So he's joining us virtually, Yale. Thank you so much for, for supporting um, this committee. And so Dr. Um, Herrera Scott mentioned at the beginning of her, her keynote um, how we need more undergraduate public health programs. And I couldn't have agreed more because over 20 years ago when I was an undergraduate, um, I did not know what public health was. There was no such thing at the school I went to. So of course I had to study accounting. And so I started my career off um, doing, you know, the CPA thing um, and being in the business worlds. And when that just left my heart a little empty, I decided to find a career that would bring the heart and the head together. And that's, as you all know, where public health lives, where you find that balance. You know, the accountants, we want balance. And so I love and thrive in public health now. And so my, my, then I was missing a little bit of that, that um, experience. So when this opportunity to become the treasurer of the Maryland Public Health Association came, it was a blessing. And so um, I, it's been a wonderful two years as, as the, the chair of the finance committee. And I will keep this um, summary or your, your finance report really brief because Suparna really just did highlight everything here um, so well and in such wonderful detail that I, I don't need to repeat most of it. Um, our highlights again were the increase in the members. You are like, the, the lifeblood of this organization um, for what you do, what you contribute, but your membership fees do really matter. Um, and, it, and it helps all these wonderful other highlights that we've heard about today um, happen. Um, and so, and of course our grants um, really just accelerate and help us deep dive into some really important topics such as climate health, which um, Melanie will get into a little bit more. Um, and all those wonderful events, um, the outreach opportunities to bring us together and to um, dive a little bit more into these issues. Um, I know that I had never uh, experienced a Narcan training and I was able to go to one this summer and it was excellent. So please take advantage of all the opportunities that come with your membership, including, um, I think you mentioned before, um, the newsletter and promoting your work and your you know, job opportunities and all that. So membership benefits, please take advantage um, because we, we really appreciate you. Um, and the organizational chapters, um, again, are a, another great um, way to get involved. Um, so reach out to your, your leaders and you know, say, we wanna join as a, as a larger group and that is fantastic as well. Um, but I'll, without going into the all of the, again, great detail that Suparna reviewed already, what would public health be without a call to action? So um, it's Giving Tuesday, as we know, you couldn't have like blinked at all without missing a Giving Tuesday. So we have some wonderful um, gifts for your donation today in the back table. I'm happy to um, facilitate that with with you before you leave our, our mugs and our water bottles. Um, and then another big call to action is to join. Um, members, we would love you to join the finance committee. Um, you do not need a CPA to be on this committee. Um, Yale was so creative. You need to be creative. You need to have trust. You need to be, have safety and the health of our finances. So that's that's what I do. I keep our finances healthy and safe to keep that motor running so that we can do the good work. Um, and um, you don't have to do it alone. We have uh, wonderful job aids and toolkits to support the whole process. And so again, my last but not least, um, again, a huge thank you to our sponsors for um, putting on this program today. Um, if anyone from Morgan State, Dr. Hawkins, are you or anyone from Morgan State, that would be, I would love to say thank you personally. Um, 
We have Healthcare for All. I believe they're joining us um, virtually tonight. Um, we have the, the Aerobiology Lab in person today, so thank you. Um, I am re representing Suburban Hospital, and we have uh, Jonathan at the R Maryland Royal Public Health Association, so thank you, everyone, for sponsoring tonight. Thank you. So a little bit more plugs. So if you have your phones, there's a QR code to scan and donate to MDPHA uh, for giving to this. So just a little plug. Um, any amount is welcome. We appreciate anything that you do. So you've heard about all that we've done as an organization this year. You all, most uh, if you uh, checked off the box that says that you want to be a member and you have a ballot, you can get involved with any of our committees. And what do our committees do? So we have our advocacy that I've talked about. So very local and state legislation. Uh, so we have opportunities for our members to get to know and take part in the advocacy process in any way, shape, or form. If you want to review any of the bills that are coming up, if you want to write testimony, provide um, oral testimony, you can be as, as involved with any of these committees as you want. And I keep hitting this microphone. I hope it's not going to affect the recording. <laughs> um, I talk with my hands. Sorry. Um, communications. Any, like, yeah, so passive relaying what we do by either email or newsletter, or website, social media. You don't have to be an expert in Canva or Adobe or whatever is being used now. Your ideas, we can bring them to light. We have very, very creative folks on our communications committee that can bring whatever, you can give them the text and they will look make it look pretty. That's what I do. Um, our membership committee, um, they are in charge of providing networking events. So if you have ideas of ways that we can get together either in person or virtually, please join us. Ways for us to reach out to our lapsed members that are no longer members of us uh, or even recruiting new members or different um, if you have um, friends that are in allied public health uh, um, programs or um, that would be great. You know, public health is really everywhere. It's not just if you have the word public health in your you know title. It's really anything that you want it to be. That's kind of how I feel um, it is. So we have membership, so three committees, and then we have a program. So if you like planning events, um, it doesn't have to be this, you know, this event here that we're at today. It doesn't have to be National Public Health. It can be any kind of webinars, any educational opportunities, trainings um, that you yourself have taken or put on. Um, and that can be any time during the year. And as Kate said, the finance committee, if you like collecting money or trying to find ways to raise money or don't feel shameless or don't feel shame about asking people for money, the finance committee wants you. Um, and then our bylaws committee, who actually uh, on a yearly basis reviews our bylaws and proposes new um, changes to our bylaws as needed. And if you're a student here, our student committee also wants you to. So if you're not a member or if you know someone that, does, that wants to be a member, Tell them to come join us. We're actually having a member um, drive this month that ends on Thursday. So get 23% off if you want to join. Please do. The majority of you here are members. So thank you all so much. We very, very, very much appreciate you all. Um, so before, we're a member-based organization. So we, the... I don't want to be greedy, but the money that you provide to us as your membership helps us do events like this, helps us all meet together, do more educational opportunities, get to meet each other. So thank you all so, so much for, you know, giving us just a little bit of, you know, your paycheck a year. So thank you all so much for that. Um, a little shameless right there. But thank you all so much for being here and feeling that you wanted to be here and hopefully that you, you know, we still have two more lovely speakers that are going to come up and talk about um, restoring trust in public health. Really the reason that we're here, we're almost done with the business meeting, I promise. Um, so we do have a few revisions to the bylaws. I'm not going to go through them here, but um, we'll be sending out a email to all the current active members and you, um, you all have an opportunity to review our bylaws um, and provide any feedback that you have. But it was really a lot of this was just reflecting that, you know, when membership dues are due, um, doing some D, uh, adding some DEIB language in there, some more specific language around some of the um, actual, uh, the actual positions on the board. The one main uh, big update that we're gonna have here is that anybody that's a member of a committee has to be a mem paid member of MDPHA. 
So that's just one, that was the biggest change that we're making this year. But please look out for that email uh, with our bylaws. Um, so the next thing that we have is doing our elections. So we have two um, lovely individuals running for president elect, and then we have one, um, one person running for secretary, and then we have six running for at large. And so on your ballot, um, you'll see that we have, um, so you select one president elect and then you just approve the secretary and at large. But what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna ask um, the two president elect, um, actually I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ask all of you to come up because actually because our nominations information is not included in our lovely program book, which I'm so upset about. Um, we do have some QR codes. Can I get, have the board members pass out the QR codes if people wanna download because they all, um, everyone that's on the nominations on the ballot submitted a lovely like you know paragraph about themselves and why they want to serve on the board of MBPHA, which is a fantastic opportunity where voices um, to come join our board. Um, so is Hannah or Victoria here? Or and I believe Victoria is on the computer. She's virtual. Okay, do you want to read it out? Okay. I can't hear you. Oh, okay. Is Hannah here? Yeah. Come to say a few words about yourself and and any other um, nominees. If y'all want to come up on stage and just introduce yourself and tell us what you do and why you want to join the board. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Hannah Idris. Sorry, I'm recovering, but um, I'm Claire. I've done the testing and I'm fine. Um, my name is Hannah Idris. Um, I was known as Hannah Dantada. I did. I just did a name change, so I have to let you know. So that in case you're trying to research me, I yes, I am a public health consultant. I have an MD background, and I did my MD. Of both in the and I business about three, four years ago in public health, uh, which is for profit, which is a more challenging uh, field to do public health in a for profit dynamic. Um, I have my reasons for that because I believe that it's actually very. Um, uh, very creative way of uh, sustainability in public health, trying to find avenues and ways to work with both nonprofit and for-profit to figure out solutions. And I think it works. So um, Health Maxima is located in Gaithersburg. We do mostly infectious disease programs uh, globally, and we're doing some local pet fund programs here in Maryland. Sorry, I get up a trail kick. <laughs> but um, very nice to meet everyone. When I saw this opportunity, I really have not been very involved with the Maryland um, affiliate. I am more in involved with the APHA, uh, APHA at large. I'm also a committee member of the women's right group there for about four years now. I'm currently the chair of that um, committee, uh, second term chair. And uh, we're doing some beautiful work there with uh, women's rights. We, we organize sessions and we uh, figure out ways to kind of uh, work with women's group to uh, find, um, to, 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 to help and advocate for women who their voices are not heard. This year we, uh, am I saying too much? You can always <laughs> ask me. <laughs> so this year we were able to um, run about five uh, oral sessions at the APHA and about, um, I think, poster sessions, about 10 poster sessions on variety of different issues, violence, um, drug in pregnancy, which you talked, which I think the secretary talked about. So a lot of important issues here. I'm very excited. I'm very excited to see that uh, Maryland Public Health Association, too, is very involved in women's rights and women's health. But um, my interest is larger than that. So I hope that doesn't limit my getting votes. <laughs> so anyway, I tried here and I hope that I get some votes. If I don't, I think the other candidate is absolutely amazing. 
I, I just believe on the map. She's absolutely amazing, <laughs> and I'm happy to support this group no matter how. So yeah. nice to meet everyone. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm reading on behalf of Victoria Ravel, who is running for president-elect. Um, all right. Oh, okay. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. As a public health practitioner, I'm running for president-elect because I'm dedicated to making an impactful difference. As a member of the Maryland Public Health Association, I'm committed to our organization's vision, mission, and goals. Through connecting and supporting Champions for Health, I aspire to empower public health leaders, increase membership, and create systems of change. The Maryland Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System notes 51.6% of all Marylanders reported having at least one chronic health condition in 2020. I desire to change that trajectory. My work has been recognized by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the American Public Health Association, the 16th U.S. Surgeon General, and the Society for Public Health Education. My experience spans for a decade of educating, for, or, sorry, my experience spans for over a decade of educating communities, evaluating programs, and implementing engage, engagement initiatives. I directed health affairs, drafted policy recommendations, co-implemented healthy or health equity and opioid overdose prevention initiatives, and co-established community sites, resulting in approximately 1,000 people testing for COVID-19. Additionally, I served our nation through the CDC's COVID-19 response and co-implemented a virtual recruitment event, which was designed to provide opportunities for up to 1,000 students and recent graduates. I have also promoted public health for Americans at home and abroad, earning a 2023 Maternal and Child Health Sections uh, Effective Practice Award. As the great-great-granddaughter of a midwife and a sixth-generation health professional, I'm committed to providing impactful service. I look forward to serving you as president-elect. Thank you. Um, any of our other nominees or um, new officers want to come up and say hi? Or you want to stand up? Is Cecia here? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> you, you need to say hello. You're not running. You're running on a post. She's running for secretary. Yeah. And then Armin is there as well. So now we have our at-large directors. So Armin, so the at-large directors are, so um, we have all of our executive committee. So that's our past president, president, president-elect, secretary, treasurer, and our um, affiliate representative for the governing council. So those are our um, executive director, um, executive committee. And then we have our at-large directors that help us kind of really strategize on ways or and also our um, um, can be co-chairs of our committees. So they're more, strategizing about ways to really um, recruit, engage, and, you know, support our members and finding new ways of and being creative. So we welcome all of them. So Armin is right there. And then Ilona, who is a returning board member. She was, she, was, she likes us so much, she wants to come back. So I'm very happy about that. Um, and then Genevieve. Hi there. I see you. Um, and then Cassandra is not here, um, but she's a returning board member as well. And Ali Diorio is a returning board member as well. And Right there, she's our current secretary, but I'm back for at large. And then uh, Kendra, hi there, nice seeing you. So those are all of our members. And um, so one more thing. And so our lovely advocacy committee co-chairs have put together these seven priorities. Um, they're all listed on your ballot. And so these are the ones that they want to focus on this year. And But um, we are open to others if you have the expertise. Don't just give us ideas and be like, sorry, I'm not gonna do anything with it because we really need your expertise and your voice to help us push these bills in a certain topic area. So this is just um, on the ballot, it's just more of a check to approve all of those um, priorities that we're gonna be focused on. So I'm very excited about all of these topics and good luck with this upcoming year with the advocacy. Uh, so like that. And then, so now I'm actually, so feel free to, Fill out your ballot, and so I'm going to actually ask Melanie to come up here and do the health table updates. At large, we can have up to 15, according to our bylaws. It could be the whole slate. Yeah. Yep. All right, Melanie. Did I lose you. <laughs> All 
I have all your slides here because I want to take care of Oh no, I don't think that's so. mm -hmm. All right. Good evening, everyone. So um, I'll be giving some updates on the health table. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Outside voice. Okay. So good evening, everyone. I'll be giving updates on the health table. Um, first, I'd like to give a special thank you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Sorry, people, I'm a little soft-spoken. Um, but a special thank you and best wishes to Allie Berry, who's the outgoing climate and health coordinator. Um, with her work in co-leading the health table with Rebecca Rare, who's the director for climate policy and justice with the Maryland League of Conservation Voters. Oh, dang it. Sorry, guys. Okay, I'm, trying, I'm just going to hold on to it. Made my help. Okay, so, of course, first I'd like to thank you. to hold this for you while you talk. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, a little, little disorganized right now. Um, okay, or there's got to be a better way. Let me, you can you probably just put it here. Yeah. Okay. So first, of course, I would like to thank Allie Berry, of course, the outgoing climate and health coordinator um, with her leadership and that of Rebecca Rare, who's currently the, re the director for climate policy and justice for the Maryland League of Conservation Voters. Um, their work has started the wonderful work that, that the health table is continuing today and that I get the wonderful opportunity to continue to do in this role. Okay, so here is me. Um, so nice to meet you all. Um, my name is Melanie Bolden uh, and I'm the incoming health, uh, climate and health coordinator. And my background is um, here listed for you guys. I have a bachelor of science in biology from the University of Arkansas. Um, I participate in Masters International um, with Peace Corps and served in Mozambique 2013 and 2015 and obtained my master's in public health in 2016. And right now I'm a part-time doctoral student at Johns Hopkins concentrating in environmental health, which led me to this wonderful role. Oh, dang. I'm struggling, sorry guys. What? Like on the, is this better? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so basically, me, I have degrees. I'm here. I'm still getting degrees, and I'm excited to work with you guys in environmental health. Um, so the health table, of course, is a coalition of public health professionals and organizations. Uh, it's a co it's, it, the coalition itself is led by a collaborative effort of the Energy Foundation, MDPHA, and Maryland League of Conservation Voters. Um, of course, we're providing a public health lens for other tables um, who are focused on other environmental uh, legislative priority categories, such as uh, transportation, building efficiency, energy efficiency. Um, those tables, we provide a public health lens for some of the legislation that they are prioritizing and work with them uh, to understand the public health lens and uh, through uh, our efforts. And our goals are to provide education, outreach, and coalition building. And here's a quick timeline of the health table. The grant was received by uh, our association in July, 2022. And by December, the health table was established and was able to foster networking and collaboration amongst public health professionals. Uh, by 2023 of January, the legislative season was in full effect the first, first uh, legislative season for the health table. And by August, um, they had produced their first fact sheet, which is focused on climate change. So here, just highlighting some of the work that the health table did during 2022 to 2023. So we were fortunate enough to um, partner with 15 different organizations. Uh, we hosted the first webinar that was focused on health and climate change and featured Dr. Chelsea Gridley-Smith, who was the director of environmental health at NACHO. Uh, there was the regional conference held, hosted in March, as well as a podcast released in July of 2023. Uh, we, uh, additionally, this this past September, hosted another webinar, which featured Maryland delegate Lord Sharkudian and Dean of University of Maryland School of Public Health, Dr. Boris Lushniak, in which we were able to um, release and share the climate change fact sheet in collaboration with this event. Um, and of course, we 
All, lots of our members were, uh, and board members for MDPHA were attendants uh, at APHA. And just, just a couple weeks ago, we released a press release um, in response to the 2023 annual Lancet countdown on health and climate change, which featured quotes from some of our partner organizations and events, Karna. So really great um, uh, opportunity and activities that we're all getting involved in uh, to promote climate change. Oh yes, and we presented at APHA. Actually the picture that I was in was from, M or from the APHA conference as well. Um, so what's next for the health table? So we actually have an ambassador training that's coming up this next Friday, December 8th um, at Bowie State University from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. There's a free three-hour training that you can do online, and then you would attend the two-hour event for networking and, adv and advocacy training um, through the Equal, through Equal America, our partner, another partner organization. Um, and of course, we're anticipating the 2024 legislative session uh, and we hope to provide more educational tools and outreach for targeted audiences, such as right now we're developing the climate, health, and water quality fact sheet, which will be our second fact sheet that we'll produce. And this year we're going to be focusing on strategically planning the next steps for the health table. What is our what does our timeline look like five years from now? Um, things of that sort. We're going to be targeting outreach, getting more organizations involved, and engagement of, as well, engaging different populations and uh, organizations. So most recent, uh, or actually, sorry, so the QR code here is from our most recent fact sheet. Did you guys hear any of that? Uh, oh. <laughs> sorry. Okay, so this QR code, if you take and scan this QR code, it'll take you to our first fact sheet, which we developed this, pa um, this past year and which was released in September. And it also leads you to how you can become more involved with the health table as a health professional. So please take an opportunity to scan the QR code. You can also alternatively email me directly. Uh, oh, dang it. Okay, um, you can also email me directly with mdpha.climate at gmail.com. Also my apologies again for my soft-spokenness. I'm not used to speaking in front of people. So I'll try to be better next year. So, um, but thank you guys so much for your time. I hope you caught most of it, so. <laughs> Thanks, Melanie. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about our work, we actually, on our w beautiful website, if you go to, um, I think it's issues, and then there's also, there's climate, I think it's climate health. Um, you can learn more about our fact sheet and ways to get involved in all the work that's been done. All right, now time for our speakers. So I want to thank so much. Um, so we have our guest speaker is Ella Green Moten, who is the current APHA president. She just got the gavel passed to her. What was it? Two weeks? Yeah, two weeks ago. In a, less than two weeks ago. Not quite two weeks. Ago. Yeah, almost there. Less than two weeks ago in Atlanta. So thank you so much. I think we're our, your first affiliate. Um, You can read more about Ella um, in our program book. I'm trying to save some time, but you can learn more about her. But I'm going to leave more time for her to come talk about what she wants to talk about. Um, so you just fit next to next time. Right here. Okay. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Is it? <laughs> no pun, no. So, guys, I, I can't tell you how excited I am to be here not just being in this building, but being in this space. Because for those of you who don't know, we made history um, last year, 2022, um, when I was elected as president-elect because um, I'm actually the first community grassroots person, um, non-degree grassroots person to be um, elected and to serve in this position. And I think it's really important um, that you know that because I stand on the shoulders of so many folk who've worked for years and years and years in public health and didn't even know they were doing public health, right? Um, some of the folk that you work with, the partners that you have, and some of the partners that you would like to have. So I just wanted to put that out there. I am still in a, a fog. I'm in a bubble. I don't know if it's ever gonna go away, um, but I think 
so that folks at the grassroots level understand how important their participation is. I'm really excited. So again, thank you. And I'm going to say welcome again to all of you for being here. And I wanted to put this someplace in my presentation. But what I'd like to say to all of you, if we could bottle the energy in this room, we'd be rich. I think you should give yourselves a round of applause. So again, I'm Ella Green Moten, and I'm serving as president of the American Public Health Association and honored to be in that position. But what I really want you to know is while I bring the words and the the message from APHA. APHA is the national voice on public health, right? But what we recognize is that we couldn't do the work that we do if it were not for folk like you, if it were not for all of the units of APHA, and especially the affiliates who are working every day to do work on the ground, uh, pushing, for public health and um, just, just working very hard to make it happen. So thank you again, Marilyn, for being who you are, for working as hard as you work, for pulling this together, for sharing information. I'm, I'm really excited. Um, I'm going to go home and share some of this stuff with my folk in Michigan because um, I haven't seen reports like this, not even in Michigan, and I'm I'm just going to put it out there, right? So, so thank you again for the work that you're doing here. But what I want to share also when you talk, and this is not a poke at um, Jonas. Because I know this is your thing, restoring trust in public health. What I have to share with you is that when I approach a topic, I usually like to talk with folk that I work with to say, I'm looking at uh, talking on this. What do you think about it? And when I talk to people on all different levels, what folk are saying to me is that Many of them don't believe the trust was ever there. So we've got a lot of work to do. There are a lot of folk who never, ever, 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 ever trusted. So we've got to figure out why that is. And we've got to figure out how to bring them on board, to, whether it's building the trust, rebuilding the trust for others, or restoring the trust. We definitely know that uh, the trust has eroded in so many areas, and especially during the COVID um, pandemic and the messaging and just everything that was happening there. And I have to share, Dr. Um, Scott mentioned Flint, Michigan. I live in Flint. I was one of those folk running around trying to tell folk, hey, something's wrong with our water. And I was PO'd with a lot of folk because they didn't tell us what was wrong with the water. So just wanted to throw that out there. So what I also would like you to do is from time to time, take a pause and think about what you're thinking. I love this cartoon because for me, it's a grounding piece because I'm pretty direct and pretty strong in what I believe. But what I also know is the fact that I believe something doesn't mean that what you believe is wrong. Now, this is pretty obvious. This is pretty obvious, right? Oh, breaking my own rules. This is pretty obvious that if you're standing on either side of the table looking at this number, one is going to see a nine and one is going to see a six. But think about it in some of the other uh, conversations that you're having with people you could be right, but it doesn't mean the other person is wrong. So as we get into trying to help people understand how they need to think 
about public health and what it means and, and really help them understand what it means. Because somebody mentioned this earlier, most folks don't know what public health is. They really don't. So as far as the workforce is concerned, which is one of the pillars of my platform, I think we should be talking to kids in elementary school about public health. We can't wait until they're graduating from high school because by then they've got other things on their plate, right? We need to be working to help people understand that public health is everything that we are and everything that we do. It's all public health. So I talked a little bit about this, um, but thinking about trust, um, I think we need to go back and think about wh where it's broken. What's broken, what's missing? What maybe was never there, what needs to be added? But we need to have these conversations. We know that having conversations is half of the battle, right? So we need to go back and do that. And the other piece is uh, when we think about uh, for restoring trust, what was there? What were the pieces that were added? Who was at the table? All of that needs to be part of the conversation to help us rebuild and build a stronger trust. And the one piece that we don't always talk about is trustworthiness. We need to be sure that we're showing up at the table trustworthy. When you go into the community, you want the community to trust you. Um, and you need to be able to show that you can be trusted. Ensuring that the necessary elements of trust are included in the process. So please, as we move through the next few days, the next few weeks, the next few months, and starting tonight, I'm going to ask each of you to think differently about how you come into a, a space and what you do with that space. So just for a moment, I'm going to ask you to take a deep breath, everybody. Take a deep breath. Allow yourselves to be present. Lean in, connect with, and dare to learn from each other. And when you think in those terms, I'm going to invite you to join me in the ease zone. Having done that, you should not only leave this meeting inspired and invigorated, you should leave personally and collectively energized, engaged, and empowered, having created and experienced the E-Zone. And I'll leave you with three uh, zoning signs to look for over the next few hours. So if you are in a space where you are able to share and receive information, you're in the E-zone. If you're in a space where you're not only uh, able to show respect, but where you're respected, you're in the E-zone. And if you're in a space where you are able to recognize, accept, and feel comfortable enough employing individual and collective power, you're in the E-zone. I think that's what's going to be necessary for us to do in order to come together and work together. Join me in the E-zone to move public health to the next level. Thank you. Thank you, Ella. Just a little something from us to take back to Michigan, you know, the other end. Um, any you. questions for Ella? So I believe we're here. So um, as president, she actually travels to a third of the affiliates 
and we got lucky this year. I think we were the first one. She could have been in Hawaii, but she chose Maryland. Um, so, but thank you so much for coming and, you know, providing your input and having the APHA president here is fantastic. I know hopefully it's a good practice for you. And I see questions, yeah. So I'd love to say it stands for Ella, <laughs> but it doesn't. It stands for uh, energized, engaged, and empowered. And I wanted to do that because oftentimes we don't uh, feel empowered. And in communities, we don't like folk coming in saying they're going to empower us. So let's create a space where we can share information, learn from each other, and become empowered and use our powers to do the work that we need to do. Yeah. 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 Yes, Pam, congratulations on, on uh, becoming the president. I, I tell you, I don't think we could have had a, a better message at the right time. Uh, I'm on the governing council, uh, and uh, for me, one of the shots heard around the world at the annual meeting was in West Virginia, became the first uh, affiliate to divorce itself from APAJ. And we're seeing it up at the American Library Association, seeing the friends with the American Medical Association, and we could. Because the first we can no longer be the American Public Health Association, a whole bunch of states started leaving. I just want to hear about your thoughts on that and kind of trying to meet people where they are. Uh, I think you really hit it on target, but I just want to hear your, your thoughts on that. And so actually, uh, I think you said it, meeting people where they are and understanding why they need to do what they need to do. Um, I think West Virginia was the, the first state I remember hearing about leaving. I don't know why, I don't have all those answers, but I'm one of those folk who like to have conversations. I wanna understand why. And if there's anything that can be done, you know, to help them stay, I definitely would wanna do that. But opening the, the talk up, having the conversation, listening to people, oftentimes we don't listen to folk, but listening and understanding what people have to say, I think would be a big step. <laughs> Any other questions for Ella? Yep, good. Um, well, thanks for your presentation. I appreciate it. I'm just curious, uh, you work with Michigan personally? Say again, do I work in Michigan? Yeah, you work with Michigan personally, like EGLE or like in general, like Ben Harbor. Uh, Flint. Flint, Flint, Michigan. Yeah. Uh, I was curious. Uh, I went to the Great Next Conference that worked with the member, and they were stating how Michigan is like a pioneer in terms of getting rid of like service lights. I was curious, do you know the reason why that's the case compared to the other states? Is it because of community engagement or what do you think the reason? I don't. I didn't attend that conference. I didn't hear that. Um, I don't know, but I would be interested in knowing and finding out. So if you could actually send me that, I would love to follow up on that just to understand what that is, because I honestly, I had not heard that. Okay. Yeah. Right here at one, two, three. One more, one, two, three. And one more, one, one, two, and three. And personally, I've actually known Ella even before she was president of APHA as a student assembly chair. I was on the executive board of APHA, and so was Ella. And so we got to work together for that one year, but you know, and with her, all of her work with the affiliates, just learning so much, and so glad that she's able to come join. So thank you so much. All right. And last but not least, um, Dr. Branch, do you want to come up and give your presentation? Um, and so Dr. Gregory Branch, he's the Director and Health Officer for uh, Baltimore County Health and Human Services. So thank you so much for driving all the way down here. And for everyone that's driving from far away, we very much appreciate it. Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. I'm not a Baptist preacher. You have to respond back to me when I say good evening, everybody. Please say 
Amen. That's all right. That's all right. I'm glad to be here before I start. I would like to introduce everyone to a wonderful lady who's my 87-year-old mother who's hanging out with me today. Everybody say hello to my mom. Laura. All right. Can I see some, some, some familiar faces? Look at that. You just sit down with Thank you so much for coming. It's wonderful. So um, I'll start off by just mentioning something. I'll give a shameless plug. Um, one of the things that I do, um, other than being the health officer and the director of health and human services, um, one of the things I like to do is merge my um, artistic side to my public health side. And one of the things that I like to do is to be able to get that information, our public health information, into the community. And one of the ways we do that is by theater. And so we have a show that I'll be doing in Baltimore um, Saturday and Sunday, December 16th and 17th, called Serenity House, From Addiction to Deliverance. About six people going through a rehab program at a church. It is a musical dramedy. And so if anybody's interested, we would love for you to come on out and see that show Ursula Battle, who's on my communication team. She's the playwright and she does a wonderful job. So I just want to kind of give you guys a shame a shameless plug in regard to that. So you guys will know some of the things that I also do other than just being in public health. I want to take this opportunity to thank the president elect Dr. Gu um, for inviting me to be a speaker here on today. Um, and I thank him for asking me to speak on the importance of rekindling and enhancing communities' trust in public health. So let's chat a little bit about public health. We all know that public health is the center of who we are and what we do. Let me repeat that. Public health is at the center of who we are and what we do. It is key to our everyday waking, walking, and working lives. Too many in the community take the um, take um, the charge of public health for granted, and too many in the community have no idea of just how far-reaching public health is. Those individuals will be surprised to know the role that public health plays in plays in eradicating diseases like smallpox, making what were once everyday illnesses like chicken pox and measles, mumps and polio and rabies and tuberculosis less and less common. Ensuring that drinking water is safe for consumption and the public beaches and swimming pools are safe for recreation. When we monitoring of emerging infectious diseases and inspecting restaurants, nursing homes, hospitals, and other food establishments for safety protocols. That's why you didn't think about eating the food and drinking the water here, because public health is already here. We are on the job. So public health is so much more than just providing annual flu shots. And that's very, very important. Getting those annual flu shots must never be minimized. But the major threat to public health, believe it or not, isn't an emerging infectious disease. The major, the major threat is the mistrust and misunderstanding the community has for public health. This, ladies and gentlemen, is dangerous. And we must remain vigilant in our effort to gain, enhance, and strengthen community trust in public health. So I need you to turn to your neighbor and ask them, how do we enhance community trust in public health? Okay, turn to ask the question. How do we enhance community trust in public health? Come on now, turn to your other neighbor and say the same thing. <laughs> But I'm just going to say to you guys, that was an excellent question. And I'm going, I'm so glad that you guys asked it. I'll tell you up front that it is not, it is not easy. That's because the mistrust is complicated 
and multi-layered. It is steeped in a long and dark history. And that history is further confounded by a failure to be transparent and forthcoming by government, faith-based organizations, and the medical community. Some of those examples may be the Tuskegee um, syphilis experiments, the Flint, Michigan um, water crisis, and religious declarations against vaccines. These are the most recognized examples of failures by the medical, governmental, and faith-based organizations. However, we must recognize that many communities have a mistrust that they experience in their everyday waking, walking, and working lives. Case in point, a young African-American male is not only thinking about those experiments that happened that occurred decades ago, he's also thinking about the mistrust and abuse he has seen and experienced personally in his own waking, walking, and working life. He's thinking about being pulled over by the police for merely driving while Black. He keeps hearing the words, I can't breathe. He keeps seeing images of strange fruit hanging from the trees. The young woman of color is thinking about the fact that her baby has a higher likelihood of dying as compared to her white counterpart. She's thinking about how she is less likely to get a life-saving cardiac procedure than her white counterpart. Or she's thinking about the injustice of her father, her brother, her husband, and her son needlessly being killed or incarcerated. I just want to make the point that it's not just a few medical obstacles that we need to overcome to lessen the mistrust in the community. Instead, it's generations of systemic failures which foster years of resentment and mistrust. Therefore, we have a huge hurdle, or should I say a mountain to overcome. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, we shall overcome. Somebody ought to say amen. That's what I'm talking about. In order for us to achieve, achieve that goal, we're going to have to crest, C-R-E-S-T, crest the mountain of mistrust that plagues our communities. Now, why is that important? Because the strength of a nation is seen in and measured by the strength of its communities. So we're going to have to crest the mountain of mistrust that plagues our communities. We have to see, communicate effectively with our communities. R, respect the thoughts, opinions um, of our community members. E, engage appropriate stakeholders appropriate stakeholders. S, share information broadly, and we have to remain T, transparent. Let's take a closer look. Communicating effectively. Simply put, we must be sure that the information that we want to share is done, done in such a way that key messages hit home with all audiences. We must be culturally sensitive and do it in multiple languages. We have to remove the communication barriers. Everyone talks about translating um, different flyers into Spanish or a different language. And everyone always says, we always miss the mark. Do you know why? Because we start with English. Don't start with English and tell somebody to translate this. Let's discuss it in Spanish. And then you don't have a translation issue because the words that I would use in English 
to be able to get a person from America who speaks that language um, naturally, right? It's going to be different the way that than the way I give that message to someone who speaks a different language. So you got to start with their culture. Stop trying to make it form from English. Make it start in that person's language. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So got to remove communication barriers. Let me tell you something. In COVID. I recognize that we need to locate services in Black communities because they needed to get the testing and they needed to get um, the vaccine. So what did I do? I said, oh, we're going to put our clinics in the Black neighborhood. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put it right in the Black neighborhood. It's going to be in the heart of the Black neighborhood and the Black people are going to come. And you know what? When we had done our clinic and we had seen what was going on, 90 to 95% of the people who came to the clinic in the Black neighborhood were white. <laughs> what is going on here, right? There's a mistrust there, right? We had to figure this one out. That's not how you just do it. You just can't say, I'm gonna put it in the community. It did not work. We've got to communicate effectively. If I have undocumented Hispanic patients, Hispanic population undocumented, guess what? I can't tell them to come to the government building to get anything. They're not going to come, right? So I've got to now meet them on neutral curve. That's important. We've got to understand that I may not be able to have my clinic in the middle of the day. They're working. And they have to do that at an off hour. We've got to communicate effectively. We need to all respect the thoughts, beliefs, and opinions of others. This is especially important when dealing with individuals from different backgrounds and cultures. We must have a continuous and open dialogue. Case in point. I needed to work with the Orthodox Jewish community um, to give them some measles shots. And so, you know, I was ready. You know, we're going we gonna to do what we got to do. We're going to do it. This is what we do. This is how we do it. We, get, we, have, we have a math clinic. I am the math clinic guru. <laughs> when I tell you that I can run a math clinic, I can run a math clinic. When Baltimore County did um, COVID shots, we were able to do 5,000 COVID shots, I mean, 500 COVID shots in an hour with less than a 15 minute wait. I mean, we can pump it out. I'm a logistics champion. Me and my team, we can work it out. So when we had to deal with the orthodox, oh, we can do this. Miss the point. First and foremost, we can't do it on Saturday. <laughs> Make sense? That was my good day. Right, I get all my staff together because we all, all Saturday, that ain't going to work. Make sense? Okay. Then they put another ring in there. They said to me, oh, you know, when you deal with the female um, population, only females can deal with them. And when you deal with the male population, only men can inject them and deal with them. Excuse me. <laughs> now you know doing public health nowadays in 20, well at the time, like 20 um 18 to 19. All my nurses are what? Female. That's the most I got, right? But it wasn't going to happen. So what did I do? I had to now figure out a way of doing this. And so we did. Change the whole setup of the mass clinic. We had a female side, we had a male side. We had female staff deal with the females. And then we had, I had to go and get my EMTs and other men who can actually inject. And we put them on the men's side. And then as we were setting up and all that kind of stuff, spoke to the rabbi who then gave us dispensation and said, you could have some of the female nurses work with the men but you cannot have the men work with the women. So guess what we did? Exactly that. And we worked that thing out. 
right? But that was something that we had to understand the culture of what was going on, right? So it's not that they didn't want the shot, it's the fact of how we had to do it, right? And so that is so we got to respect the thoughts and belief and opinions of others. We have to e engage appropriate stakeholders. Partnering with engaging community stakeholders goes a long way towards gaining community trust. It's ongoing. We have to hire community health workers who are out in the community during the, re the regular time so that when we have a pandemic or an emergency, that voice is already there. We've got to deal with our faith-based leaders, um, and we've got to understand that the faith-based leader is not always the pastor, right? It's going to be faith-based leaders that are on a lot of different levels. We've got to deal with community organizers and influencers, especially in the LGBTQ community. That is very, very important get the organizers and the com community influences. S, sharing information broadly. Make sure the information is available in several languages and share it broadly. Sharing it broadly is one of the most important things that we can do, but it's actually very difficult for the government to do that. Why? Because the negative influences use various free platforms to get their word out. But for us to counteract that, I got to pay. <laughs> right? I got to pay for that. And the fact of the matter is, they don't give me money in my budget to do all of that. So we have to think and work and respond differently. I'm going to give a prime example. If you got negative influences out there, why don't we hire positive influences? But can anybody raise their hand and tell me if in their company they have a job description for a positive influencer? It's unheard of. Go to the private industry. They hire on um, positive influences all the time. We've got to get with the program. Right, we have to do that. That's so important. We gotta change the way we think and how we share this information. Because if we don't do that, we're always behind the time. Does that make sense? Okay, we've gotta be transparent, that's that key. All engagement efforts should be clear and understood by the community and have no hidden or alternative agendas. Being transparent is telling the community the good, the bad, and the ugly. Just tell them. Because guess what's going to happen? Whenever it's in the dark, it's going to come to the light. So why are we holding on to this information? Just tell it and have them partner with us to do better. Right? I used to have issues as a health officer when I knew that in one particular community, there was some um, data that wasn't the best data. I got a lot of <clears throat> overdose deaths on the end line. But I can't say that because if I got the politicians on the east side who get upset about the property that, see, that, no, no, know how silly that is? You know why? because everybody can see the people who are not on the east side. But, but, but you can see it, you know what's going on. They, everybody know it. People say, you know, I, I don't want that in my backyard. Baby, it's not only in your backyard, it's in your front yard, and it's in your living room. And many times it's in your bedroom. Somebody say amen. <laughs> so therefore, we gotta just, you know, let, you, know you gotta just tell the truth and shame the devil. Just, just be transparent about it. Let people know, you know, our communities are much more accepting of the truth than they are of hiding something and finding out stuff later on. Just be transparent. Make sense? So when dealing with public engagement, we must crest this mountain of mistrust. 
Now, the Baltimore County Department of Health and Human Services, we utilize all these crest points and tools during the COVID-19 pandemic. You may remember during that time that we were building the plane while we were flying. That's because we didn't have most of the things we needed to be successful at the onset. We didn't have no staffing, right? So we have to do contact tracing. Well, we needed 50 to 75 people to do contract tracing when it came to COVID. I had six people on my staff, okay? So, and Charles County had two, right? Um, we needed hotlines. We needed nurses and we needed doctors and logistics staff. We needed all this stuff, but we didn't have that. So we had to start for like almost six months just robbing Peter to pay Paul to deal with the pandemic that was ensuing. We didn't have the equipment. We didn't have a registration system. We didn't have a testing and vaccine IT platform. We had none of that. The registration system was a system that we had to have because at the beginning, remember at the beginning of the vaccines that everybody couldn't get the vaccine, you know? So we had to figure out who fit those categories, right? So, and then we only had this much vaccine. So we had to build a registration system within our county for people to register. So as we got the vaccine, we will be able to reach out to the high risk population. We did not have a registration system. 2020, we don't have a registration system. So what did I have to do? On Friday, I'm dancing and I'm talking to the IT person. I need this, I need this. He's like, okay, I can work that out. And I kind of said, when you need it by? Monday. <laughs> Monday. Yeah, I need my, my, we got We have to do this. It's coming out. Right? I got it. Right. So then, now they are working overtime over on that weekend to get that system out on Monday morning, so we can have a press conference and tell everybody go in and register. It's that we were building the plane while we were flying. flying. So hindsight is twenty twenty, and I'm going to say this to you guys, and so. Help me with this. The funding system of local health departments are primarily grants. That's what, that's what basically funds us. So we do what the grant tells us to do, not necessarily what needs to be done. Does that make sense? Uh, Y'all got that, right? Okay. So if the grant tells you to pay the staff member to do this particular work, when you have an emergency declaration, the grant says you can't use, you can't pay your staff with my, with my grant to do that. So you got staff walking around saying, oh, I work for the WIC grant. And so the WIC won't let us pay for the COVID. So I can't do nothing for COVID. The devil is a liar. <laughs> Okay, because you work for the Department of Health and Human Services, and you're going to do what I tell you to do, right? As an experienced health officer, I understood and knew that money would probably come. You're going to do what I tell you to do, and you're going to document that on your timesheet, because I know that later on, I can now jump and feed back what needs to be taken care of, right? So help me, guys. When the president or the governor calls a public health state of emergency, that should mean all hands on deck. It doesn't make a difference what federal or what state grant you have. It is a public health. Why are we having this conversation and people are dying? Right. The people who I have who are working in those grants, because I have them, I have already trained them on our coup plan. I've already trained them on how to do a um, a mass clinic. That's what we do. So my, my team, all of my staff are ready to do that. But because of the grant that they're in, they're not supposed to do that. That makes no sense. To me, 
state of emergency, all hands on deck. And that is important, notwithstanding the union contracts or the grant limitations. We have to be able to understand that we in public health have to be ready to respond when there is a public health threat and crisis. It is a matter of life and death, period. Let's be ready. Let's do what we have to do. This having to have a conversation and a discussion about where the funding is coming from and, and you're supposed to be doing it. Everybody at this point now, all hands on deck, we have a crisis on our hands. We have always got to be prepared. Always remember that yesterday's victories don't guarantee tomorrow's success. When we talk about crest and COVID, we recognized early on that COVID was having detrimental effects in mostly black and brown communities. This is where mistrust of public health ran rapid. And that was very apparent when I placed the vaccine clinics in a black and brown community. It was just right. So we had to develop and implement an initiative called VOICE, V-O-I-C-E. That was Vaccine Outreach Initiative for community equity. And that was to ensure that black and brown and homebound individuals had access to COVID-19. So the homebound individuals, because that was another group of people that can't come to you. We got to go to them, right? And how do you get to the homebound folks, especially when the vaccine is in a, a vial for 10 doses? And once you pop that vial, you got to use it, right? So am I gonna travel all over the country and all over the county trying to give away those 10? So we had to work that through, okay? Our voice was extremely successful and utilized the Crest approach at every step. We communicated effectively. We used data to pinpoint the high risk areas and then we went to those high-risk communities to hand out safety kits. I'm gonna tell you how good the data was. The data was so good, I can pinpoint it to the block where somebody lived. So therefore, when we would see a certain amount in a particular area, and we're talking about a block, two blocks, we would then go straight to that community, straight to that, to that um, housing development, and we would start handing out our safety kits. We were handing out masks, hand sanitizers, and medical information. Because remember, early on, we couldn't find the masks. Early on, we didn't have enough hand sanitizer. We circulated educational information about COVID and the importance of being vaccinated in multiple languages. Remember, start with the native language. Stop trying to translate what was in English to that other language. We instituted a hotline seven days a week to answer COVID-related questions, and we used bilingual staff on those. People feel much more comfortable if they can speak in their native language. And then we also provided food boxes to meet the need when we discovered when interacting with these communities, that's what they needed. So I was able to get them out for a vaccine shot of information, and I was also giving them the food that they needed. All respect the thoughts and opinions and beliefs of others. We, we recognize the long held mistrust early and the root causes of that mistrust. So we participated in public forums to respond to concerns about the vaccine um, and any long term effects of it. We addressed the individual concerns over the hotline and made appropriate referrals to various settings. We engaged the appropriate stakeholders. We partnered with community influencers and faith-based leaders to engage them to help us develop and deliver pertinent information. 
we advise faith-based leaders on the appropriate safety precautions and accurate medical information to share with their congregations. We hosted clinics and locations most accessible to our target audience and during non-traditional hours, right? And we went to the churches, we went to the synagogues, we went to the schools, we went anywhere we thought that people would actually come in the community. We had to be able to explain what was going on and explain in simple terms, what is a variant, right? I won't go into that at this point now. We can have that conversation on the side, okay? But I was able to explain that in a very simple way that people would walk away saying, I think I understand that. That was important. We shared information broadly. We utilized several forms of advertising spread the messages, printed flyers in various languages, television commercials, radio spots, social media platform, transit ads, like the bus, the light rail, and the bus shelters, and then we did speaking engagements. And then transparency. We established transparency on the onset when there was not a ready supply of vaccines. I told them, we don't have enough vaccine. I'm not going to sugarcoat that. I'm not, we just don't have enough. I would say, they gave me 100 doses. Remember that, Dr. Abney? They, I, I got 880,000 people in my county, and they gave me 100 doses. Well, listen, they gave me 100 doses. But I'm not going to, I can't sugarcoat that. I need you to understand exactly what's going on. We, we created our public registry for, um, scheduling vaccines, and then we just maintained that transparency through the pandemic. Um, we hired our community health care workers to continually address community concerns, and we created a public website where the COVID data was actually placed so they can actually see it. There is a lot of mistrust that occurs in the community, and it's not always something that we do intentionally, but we've got to recognize that mistrust is there. So in conclusion, I see Dr. Gould looking at me. He's getting closer and closer. <laughs> if public health is to be an effective tool, it's meant to be, it, it, and it meant to be, we need to be continually enhancing community trust. We must advocate for needed resources that will make us strong and keep us ready. We need to move away from the build the plane while flying and instead become an always ready and able entity. And who serve, um, and we who serve in the public health must always make our voices heard and be strong advocates for our profession. When this is done, we will be well on our way to restoring and enhancing communities' trust in public health. So remember, the strength of a nation is seen in and measured by the strength of its communities. So the trust of a nation is seen in and measured by the trust in the community. So let's crest that mountain and rekindle and enhance the community's trust in public health. God bless you all. A little something for you. Any questions for Dr. Branch? Good. Hi, my name is Nancy Blue, and I'm from uh, USC. I'm curious to know uh, whether and how public health departments got vaccinated into the prison because prisoners were listed as top priority. Uh, and I've not been able to get any information I have had in my feet, but to find out whether prisoners were in fact prioritized to be the I will tell you what happened in Baltimore County. So what I will say to you, the fact that I already had a relationship because of the substance abuse issues and the medical issues that were happening in the detention center. So I was already in there. I already had a relationship because I'm the one who had to help approve who the medical contractor was for the detention center. So having that relationship and understanding that when I got vaccine, I was able to give it to the detention center as soon as they gave me more than 100, right? Because I had to, I had to vaccine my staff first, right? But we, we started vaccinating the, um, the, the workers and the detention center almost immediately. 
we were able to do that. Now, in other jurisdictions, they may not have been able to do that because they didn't have that relationship already built in. But in Baltimore County, we already had that relationship. So let me just explain to you how I did it during the um during the epidemic. During the epidemic. What we all know is that there was a whole government of people who were home being paid. And so I had the bright idea and my team said, we need more people, all hands on deck. So we went to the county executive and said, Mr. CD, we need more people. All the people that you're paying at home, I need you to make them come in and work with the Department of Health. Okay, now, other jurisdictions couldn't do that. My county exec, John O, wonderful, wonderful leader. He said, that makes sense. We're going to do that. Brought those people in begrudgingly. They were not happy. But I had to have them out like you guys are. I stood before them, and I gave an inspirational talk. And I said, when your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren look back on this unprecedented um, uh, pandemic, what will you say to them that you did alleviate the ills of your community? That you sat home and did nothing and watched TV? Or that you were out there on the front line testing and giving immunizations? And everybody was like, well, we're going to get immunization. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> and so we had, I had enterprise wide staff. So I couldn't give 500 do doses an hour with only my health and human services staff. It was enterprise wide staff. For me to do that, I had almost 150 people working every shift. So once you would do that, they actually might work for health and human services where they're like their own jobs. So they were like, well, can we go back to health and human services? Because we might be <laughs> I would love to have you. So it is now, I think, critical to start now to have the introduction and the continued um, education on what we should be doing during a pandemic. So we should be teaching that enterprise why, not just to our staff. If we teach it to them now and they learn it, if something happens, then they're ready to help us out. So I do believe that it needs to be in that curriculum. It needs to be a part of orientation or whatever it is that you have in your country, enterprise-wide, for them to understand what a cool plan is and what we do in regard to a public health threat, an emergency, and any other emergencies. That is all hands on deck as a government employee. I don't know about you all, but I feel so inspired. There's not enough time in the day to do all the things that we've been asked to do, but let's try doing it. How about that? All right, let's give it up again for all of our speakers. Um, one quick housekeeping thing, there's dessert in the back. Please eat it. I know we're public health professionals, but there's brownies and cookies. Please eat it. You can also get some tea if you would like. Um, if you still have a ballot, please um, raise your hand. And we'll take that. And now to the fun part. Um, why is it not filled forward? 
So the MDPHA President's Award, this is an award that the president of MDPHA gets to give every year to a person that, or an individual that has uh, that had an impact on the public health of Maryland. And so I felt, you know, Lillian has done so much good work for MDPHA, but then as soon as I heard about all the work that she's done, and so I just kept, I just kept reading her bio and I'm just like, she's such an obvious choice. And it was just such a pleasure to work with her and like, the amount of work, like, honestly, like, as a, um, I'm talking about, like, as a, a committee chair, she wasn't even a board member last year. The amount of work that she did to just empower our communications committee and just kind of bring that energy, I was like, who is this woman? Like, I want her on my board. Like, let's do this. And so I convinced her to join the board, and she has hit the ground running with the help of our um her other communications co-chair and all the interns and everyone that's on the committee. And, like, Honestly, just go to any one of our social media pages and you can see just you'll scroll and that's just one week. Like the amount of things that have been pushed out there, the amount of work that she has done. When the, if the governor thinks she, that she has done amazing work, then she's clearly done amazing work. So it is my pleasure and my honor to um, award the Leon Agbe uh, Agbe the President's Award for this year. Thank you. If you want to say a few words, yes. Um, my daughter was my younger daughter was um, two when I began my doctoral program, and she's been with me through all the journey attending board meetings with me, working. I remember when I was doing my doctoral program, sometimes I'll put her to bed and I'm working and then like two hours later, I'll see somebody come like, mommy, are you done? I'm just like, oh my goodness. And she's been with me for all these years. I'm so very grateful for her support. My older daughter lives in the UK, there's a time difference, but sometimes I forget and I call her, there's something I want to talk about and she picks up the phone and then I'm like, oh my goodness, are you supposed to be sleeping? I'm like, mom, it's okay. Uh, I, I really have a passion for public health. I think for me, it's a calling and it's just been very wonderful to work with all the wonderful people in MDPHA. Um, Judy, thank you for, she was like, then you have to do more. And then I just came in and we're doing your public health professional and your longest work. And so it's a pleasure to serve. Thank you. Okay, I get the pleasure of presenting this next award, the MDPHA Leadership Award. And I think uh, it's a special privilege for me because I get to work at the same institution where she works. <laughs> Dr. Gillian Fry is a public health program coordinator and professor at Towson University. She has published numerous articles on environmental justice and sustainability and has been asked to speak at many conferences. On top of this, she's dedicated her time to shaping the future, future public health leaders like all of us, myself included. She helped establish the Towson University Students for Public Health, the third chapter of the student section of MDPHA. She has paved many ways for students to engage in the field of public health and will be a great candidate, a great candidate for the leadership award. According to Dr. Fry, it means a great deal to be nominated by one of her students and to receive this award from MDPHA. Starting the student group at Towson University for Public Health and getting it affiliated with MDPHA has brought our public health students together and created a lot of enthusiasm the students, faculty, and now all of us have opportunities to work together to spread public health messages on campus and we'll love be able to meet and hear from all our MDPHS leaders. So on behalf of MDPHA, Dr. Lillian Fry, we present you with the Leadership Award. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One, two, 
just let you all know, it's such an honor to be here with you all. Um, it, it really is such an inspiring night. Um, just so that you're all aware, we have an undergraduate public health program at Towson. We have over 300 very enthusiastic undergraduate public health majors. Gladys is here tonight. She is an intern with MDPHA. Poor Gladys has two classes with me this semester. It's so, it's such a pleasure to have Gladys in um, in both of my classes. Um, so I'm just so inspired being here with you all. Thank you so much for this award. Public health is hard, y'all. We are working so hard, and it is just so nice to you know uh, get recognition. Um, and please think about Towson. Um, I'm hearing our inspiring speakers and I'm already starting my emails to you, asking you to come speak to us at Towson. So please keep us in mind. Um, our, my students would love to connect with you. Thank you. Hey. Hi, everybody. I'm Jody Gann, and I get to present the Outstanding Public Health Program Award. Um, I want to just thank our meeting organizers uh, tonight um, for bringing us all together. So this next award does not go to a person whose name rhymes with Jillian or Lillian. I'm just saying <laughs> that. <laughs> How many people do we have in the house from Montgomery County, Maryland? Yes. All right, well, I am very pleased to have nominated and get to present the Outstanding Public Health Program Award um, to the Latino Health Initiative of Montgomery County for their fabulous media campaign, La Abuela. Has anybody seen La Abuela? I, <laughs> um, I was trained uh, to do door knocking for vaccine outreach, and as part of our training, um, I saw the video of adorable La Abuelina and was just instantly impressed. And I used La Abuelina in my teaching materials at American University, and I thought I'm going to nominate for the award. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the campaign. And we're going to show you just the 30 second clip, and then we will um, bring our representatives up um, to get the award. So um, La Abuela COVID-19 campaign, it's a, co it's a component of Montgomery County government's Latino Health Initiative and Por no Nuestra Salud Bienestar, which is a community partner focusing on reaching the Latinx population. And so as you'll see, this campaign features Abuelina, her husband, Don Carlos, and their grandchildren. And the campaign was created from focus groups with county um, residents of the Latinx population. And you'll just see firsthand how much grandmothers are respected um, in this group. And La Abuelina's sage words really protected a lot of people from um, COVID, encouraging them to take all sorts of safety precautions, including getting vaccinated. So Suparna, can, I, can you come and roll the, the footage, please? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Y guarda distancia, que no te alcanza el COVID. Ya ni siquiera lo levanto. Eso no lo tienes. Es pobre. Tranquilo. Yo te duro. Llama al 301 270 84 32 porque nuestra salud y bienestar solo te tienen que lograr. Okay. So, in addition, and there's several different installations of la abuelina giving different advice as to. What? Right. Okay. <laughs> this sounds like one of my classes, right? <laughs> um, so I just want to say, in addition to the stellar health communication co component, the campaign also addresses social barriers by bringing vaccines to people's houses to accommodate non-traditional work hours, like Dr. Branch said, is key. So without further ado, it's the pleasure of the Maryland Public Health Association to award the Outstanding Public Health Program, Public Health Program to the Montgomery County Latin, Latino Health Initiative. And we have Ingrid um, Lazara and Roberto Gar Garza Rodriguez here to accept the award.
Yeah, congratulations. Oh, yeah. Big fans. <laughs> Thank you. We smile for pictures. Yeah. So, Connor, want to get it? <laughs> Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Department of Health and Human Services of the Montgomery County, the Latino Health Initiative, we are very honored to receive this award. I also want to shout out to Henry Montes, one of our co-chairs of the Latino Health Steering Committee who's joining us. Um, as you guys can tell, we worked a lot during COVID-19 and we prioritized communications in Spanish to our community. So if you guys wanna learn a little bit more about the work that we do, I invite you guys to go over to YouTube and see all the wonderful videos we created. Um, we're also on social media and we're just continuing to work um, in closing the gap and bringing more information to our community via social media. So thank you guys so much. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. All right, I would like to bring up uh, Jody Gann and Kate McGrail. Um, they are both leaving our board very sadly. Um, and so I want to thank them for their years of dedication. But Jody has been a MDPHA board member and member for years and I'm so thankful to have her as my board mentor and person that I kind of went to was like Jody is this what I need to do like what else do I need to worry about and then she would give me all of her like knowledge and all that stuff so I got a little flack for her for all of her just appreciation for all of the work that she's done for this organization I think <laughs> thank you and I want to I want to thank Kate for the tough job of treasure and keeping our book straight and for giving and engaging. I only Kate can give a really fun presentation about money. <laughs> so thank you, Kate. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, and everything I learned I really was from these two presidents that um, really set a really strong foundation and helped answer my questions so that I could do the fun part, like keeping books. And telling us what we can't spend money oh. on. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, quick, two quick things. So we've talked about the Climate Ambassadors training. So we have two advocacy trainings actually next week. One is on Friday. So one is the Climate Ambassadors one that Melanie was talking about. Um, there's more information here and also on our website. And we also have another ad, uh, more overall advocacy training. It's virtual. Um, both Ilona Tosin and Stephanie Klepper from the Maryland Healthcare for All will be giving a training next Wednesday from 11.30 to 1, and that's completely virtual. Information is available on our website, nvpha.org. And last but not least, the thing that's closest to my heart, the Mid-Atlantic, well, in addition to this conference, uh, is the Mid-Atlantic partnership um, that we're having. So we're going to have a virtual conference March 1st on the future of public health future of public health, AI, and machine learning. So we hope you'll be able to join us for that. It's completely virtual. Um, and just thank you for attending. Thank you all for staying so long. We went a little bit over. Please take some food, take some more swag. If you're a faculty member and you have students that want any swag, please take it. Um, and thank you all so much. Please look out for our emails and opportunities to get involved. If you don't think that you have five minutes, you do have five minutes to just kind of you know, just like a post on Facebook, like, you know, reshare something on LinkedIn. Um, little quick ways for to get involved. So thank you all so, so much. It's been a pleasure being president for this past year. Can't wait to have a little bit more time in my life to do things that I love, just teaching and, you know, mentoring the next career, uh, next um, students in public health. So, and then I'm just gonna have Jonas come say a quick word about, let's go. Thank you all for coming, and I look forward to seeing you next year when I'll be the one in her place. So thank you all, and thank you for your supporting MDPHA. Thank you.
Can I just have the board members on stage? I just want to take one quick photo that while we're all still here. But thank you all so much. Drive safely. Have a great holiday season. And um, thank you all so much for your support of MBPHA. Could we have all the board members so we could take a group picture? All board members, please. Oh. Raffle. But I don't, yeah, we don't have time. Yeah. Do we have all the MDPHA board members? Thank you. Yeah, you have to Jody Gann, the stage, please. <laughs> Thank you. 